In the headlines tonight, President Park Geun-hye says her administration will make realistic and practical measures so that a reunified Korea does not remain as a dream or an unreachable goal. The Korean economy will face adverse consequences if structural reforms are not made in the near future. That's according to Korea's finance minister. The number of lives claimed last year by the civil war in Syria tops 76,000. Stay with us for these and more coming right up. Hello and welcome everyone. You're watching Early Edition at 6, brought to you live from Seoul. I'm Na hyun -gyal. And I'm Daniel Che. Thank you for joining us. President Park Geun-hye hosted a New Year's ceremony at the presidential office this Friday for some 200 figures, including the Prime Minister, the National Assembly Speaker, and senior lawmakers from the rival parties. Well, she didn't give a direct answer to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's apparent offer for high-level talks in the new year, but she did stress the importance of paving the path to reunification. For our top story, here's Song ji -sun. Reunification is no longer a dream, and preparations are needed to make sure it becomes reality. In a New Year's greeting ceremony at Tongwada on Friday, President Park Geun-hye pledged realistic plans toward realizing reunification of the two Koreas. Although she did not clearly state a response to North Korea's willingness to hold an inter-Korean summit, Park said that it is the current generation's duty to hand over a united Korea to the next, and practical measures are the only means to realizing it. President Park, in her New Year's address on the last day of 2014, expressed a determination to improve Seoul's relations with the North this year. Domestically, the president pledged reforms, saying that 2015 should be a year of national innovation. Park stressed that outdated customs and systems must be replaced across all sectors, not just with regard to the economy. President Buck also noted that Seoul will work toward topping a GDP per capita income of 30,000 U.S. dollars this year and toward extending that figure to 40,000 per person in the near future through the government's three-year economic reform plan. Song ji -sun, Arirang News. Now, before hosting that New Year's gathering, President Park spoke on the phone with UN General uh, Secretary General Pan Ki-moon today. Right, and during their conversation, the UN chief stressed his commitment to providing support for the president's offer of inter-Korean dialogue. President Park said she looks forward to that support for improving the fundamentals of inter-Korean ties and the human rights situation in the North. Praising uh, President Park's leadership on the international stage last year, Pan also thanked Korea's pledge of up to $100 million to the Green Climate Fund. He added he wishes to see her take on a greater diplomatic role at the upcoming 70th UN General Assembly session, as well as at a special summit on the so-called post-2015 development agenda. Now, North Korea watchers at both home and abroad are keeping their eyes on the New Year exchanges between Seoul and Pyongyang. The most attention is being directed to whether the leaders of South Korea and North Korea will be able to sit down face to face in 2015. For this report, here is Hwang Sung-hee. Under the right mood and conditions, there is no reason for us to hold back from the highest level talks. We will put our utmost efforts to, for practical progress in dialogue and negotiations. The South Korean government hopes to hold any form of inter-Korean talks in the near future. The two Koreas kicked off the new year by expressing their willingness for inter-Korean dialogue. But what's the chance of them getting back to the negotiating table? Kim Jong-un's apparent summit offer is his first since he took power in 2011, but it comes with strings attached. Seoul must halt its annual military exercises with Washington. North Korea has always protested the drills, which take place between February and March. South Korea says it has no plans to cancel the exercises this year. Kim also stressed Pyongyang will not give up its nuclear program, pledging to stick to the so-called Pyongjin policy or the dual development of nuclear arms and the economy. 
Still, analysts say the North Korean leader has shown a strong determination to talk with the South, and they expect the regime to propose various forms of dialogue. This as Kim seeks to end Pyongyang's diplomatic isolation by reaching a breakthrough with Seoul. President Park will also want to make some progress with the North in her third year in office. But analysts say South Korea must first test North Korea's sincerity before jumping back into talks. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. While the U.S. government says it supports improved inter-Korean ties, there is skepticism among American experts over Kim Jong-un's possible summit offer. They are telling policymakers in Seoul and Washington to take the young leader's words with a grain of salt. For more, here's Ji myung -gi. U.S. experts have cautioned against getting too carried away with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's New Year's address, in which he called for a major shift in inter-Korean ties. They question his sincerity as Kim made clear that Pyongyang has no intention of backing away from its nuclear ambitions. U.S. pundits say that Seoul and Washington will only come back to the negotiating table if North Korea shows a willingness to denuclearize. The Brookings Institution, a conservative U.S. think tank, says Seoul and Washington should be cautious when yielding to any new demands or when trying to bring North Korea back to the negotiating table, as it could entail excessive costs. The Center for Strategic and International Studies says it's too early to evaluate Pyongyang's stance and that South Korea should wait for possible talks with the North in January. Some U.S. experts say Pyongyang is trying to deflect the international community's concerns about its human rights problems by issuing conciliatory gestures to South Korea. Diplomatic sources in Washington say a willingness from North Korea to dismantle its nuclear program must come before talks, but added the recent Sony Pictures hacking will negatively affect the issue. Kim young Arirang News. Despite Kim Jong-un's insistence that military drills between South Korea and the U.S. be canceled as a precondition for inter-Korean summit talks, Seoul says no, they will do no such thing. South Korea's defense ministry said Friday that the key resolve full legal exercises slated for March will go on as planned. The ministry said that since the two Koreas are technically still at war, Seoul needs to continue training to enhance military readiness. An armistice agreement was signed at the end of the Korean War in 1953, leaving the two Koreas in a ceasefire. Two of North Korea's most powerful families have reportedly strengthened their bond through marriage. Local reports citing unnamed sources say North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's younger sister, Kim Yo-jung, married Choi Ryong-hae's second son last year. Choi is considered the second most powerful man in the North Korean regime. North Korean state media released a photo of Kim Yo-jung on Friday showing what appears to be a wedding ring on her left hand. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best. With Na Hyung Young and Daniel Che. Arirang News. Arirang News. Arirang News. On early edition at 6. A member of the Korean medical team currently in Sierra Leone to help treat Ebola victims may have been exposed to the virus. Korea's foreign ministry says the unnamed person had direct contact with a needle that was used on an Ebola patient. The head of Korea's disease control center described how it happened. Have a listen. And this finger part of the medical worker's three-layer glove ripped while drawing blood from an Ebola patient at a treatment center near Freetown. The medical worker made contact with the needle, but shows no sign of injury or symptoms of the Ebola virus. The medical worker will be sent to a hospital in Germany on Saturday and will be placed in isolation for 21 days for observation. This development comes after a Korean team of four doctors and six nurses were sent to Sierra Leone last month. 
Now, the number one priority for Korean finance minister Choi Kyung-hwan this year will be pushing for structural reforms. He says without those changes, the Korean economy will face disastrous consequences. For this story, here's Hwang Ji-hae. Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan has pledged to do his best to push through structural reforms that he says are not only critical for the Korean economy, but inevitable. In his New Year's address, he said Korea would fail to create more jobs and provide more welfare benefits without the reforms. He added the government will not ignore the fact that younger, unemployed people believe they're not needed, that one out of every three employees is a temporary worker, and that retired baby boomers are rushing to open small businesses in sectors that are already highly competitive. Chess said the problems stem from structural issues in the economy like an inflexible labor market, an imbalance between exports and domestic demand, a shrinking workforce due to the aging population and low birth rates, and the decreased competitiveness of major manufacturers. Che also said the Korean economy could also struggle just as the Eurozone and Japanese economies have if the government fails to meet its reform goals. In his overall evaluation of last year, the finance minister said the domestic economy managed to lay the foundation for structural reforms through aggressive expansionary policies. He added that Korea also received better sovereign ratings than Japan while expanding its free trade reach into countries like China. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors have set their global sales target for the new year at 8.2 million cars, which will represent the weakest pace of sales growth since 2003. Hyundai Motor Group Chairman Chung Mong Gu in his New Year speech said the company will raise its brand awareness overseas in 2015 by producing quality green cars and increasing the localization of its products. As for the conservative target, analysts point to unfavorable currency conditions namely the strengthening of the Korean won against the Japanese yen and the slow global recovery as prominent risks. We have no way of knowing what 2015 has in store for us, but most experts agree. One certainty is increased competition in the eco-friendly car market. Global brands are gearing up to roll out new models in step with global efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Our Son Jung-in shows us what to expect. A brand new lineup of eco-friendly cars will be released in 2015. Hyundai Motor, which just recently unveiled a new Sonata Hybrid, is expected to launch a plug-in hybrid version as will BMW, Porsche and Audi. The Korean automaker is also launching a new compact hybrid-only brand for the first time in the country, hoping to compete with Toyota and Honda, which are currently the only two companies in the world that sell hybrid-only models. The year 2015 marks an important start for the domestic green car market to expand. The competition in the compact SUV market is also forecast to be fierce. Sangyong Motor will launch its Tivoli next year, pitting it against General Motors' Chevy Trax and Renault's Samsung Motors' QM3 crossovers. Steady selling models won't be far behind. Hyundai's Avante, which has sold over 10 million units worldwide, and Kia's Optima K5 will roll out new models in 2015. Meanwhile, in the luxury car market, the new full-size sedan Aslan and K9 Quantum will go head-to-head -head against each other, among others. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. It's a good year for non-smokers in Korea and a difficult one for smokers here. The government says it aims to bring down the nation's smoking rate with higher prices coupled with more areas being designated as non-smoking zones. Our Kwon so has this report. Where there was once a variety of cigarette brands of different styles and flavors, the shelves at many convenience stores stand stripped bare. This as smokers were busy grabbing as many cigarette packs as they could before the price nearly doubled on New Year's Day. This scramble shows that many smokers in Korea are not planning on kicking the habit, as is the government's plan. While some question whether the newly inflated prices will have a long-term effect on habitual smokers, it's hard to quit. I think I will continue to smoke. 
Many researchers believe the policy will encourage people to stop out smoking. Scientific evidence shows that the cigarette price raises about 10% would reduce tobacco consumption by about 4% in developed countries. We believe this will equally happen in Korea. And also the government implemented other tobacco control policies, so this will also help uh, reduce tobacco consumption. Those other policies are to do with where smokers can light up. Smoking is now banned in all restaurants regardless of their size. In cafes, chairs and tables have disappeared from smoking areas, meaning customers will be allowed to smoke in a designated zone, but they will not be allowed to eat or drink while doing so. Smokers say they pay their taxes and the high cigarette prices and that this is too much. Some just leave without buying a coffee. Even though they do not contain tobacco and are usually odorless, electronic cigarettes are also subject to the ban. The new policies came into effect on January 1st, but there will be a grace period of three months, giving smokers and businesses time to adapt. For smokers, they'll be left with a simple choice. Put up with the new strict rules or stop smoking once and for all. Kwonsoa, Arirang News. Over in China, the country's leader has ordered an investigation into the stampede that claimed nearly 40 lives on New Year's Eve in Shanghai. The exact cause has not been identified, but local police do say that it wasn't because of some fake money thrown from a nearby club. Kim Min-ji tells us more. Chinese President Xi Jinping has ordered a probe into a stampede that killed dozens in Shanghai on New Year's Eve. The incident happened about 25 minutes before midnight in the city's Bun district, where thousands of people had gathered to count down to the new year. At least 36 people, many of them students, were killed and dozens more were injured. President Xi has called for all-out efforts to attend to those affected while ordering local governments around the country to make sure such accidents do not happen again. The investigation will likely focus on whether there were enough police officers to control the huge crowds. Chinese media reports that nearly 300,000 turned up in Shanghai for celebrations last year. The injured, many of which have been hospitalized, recalled the accident. I was hanging around the Bun district when it happened. I remember standing on a step and then passing out all of a sudden. When I woke up, I was lying on the ground. There was a woman next to me who had been helping me all the way. She told me not to fall down. I guess I would have died if I had fallen down. Shanghai police denied social media reports that the stampede was triggered by people trying to pick up fake cash dropped from the balcony of a nearby nightclub. Police say the bills were thrown after the stampede took place. Kim min Arirang News. A funeral was held for the first victim identified from the Air Asia flight that crashed into the Java Sea six days ago. The body of a 49-year-old passenger was handed over to her family on Thursday at a ceremony in the Indonesian city of Surabaya. Ten bodies have reportedly been recovered so far, but bad weather continues to hamper the search for the victims and the plane's black box. It's unclear what brought down the plane with 162 passengers on board. Citing investigators, Reuters reports that the pilot may have climbed above the clouds too steeply while trying to avoid a storm. 2014 was a torrid year for Syria. The country lost more than 76,000 people to its civil war. The worst part is the killings are expected to continue this year as strikes by the Islamic State militants and sectarian violence in Iraq show little sign of easing. Connie Kim has this report. 2014 was the deadliest year in the four-year-long Syrian civil war. The UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says more than 76,000 people were killed in the nation last year. And more than 17,000 of that total were civilians, including 3,500 children. The civil war, which started as an uprising against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, has now become a multi-front conflict one that opened the door for the rise of the Islamic State militant group. The loss of life, however, isn't expected to decline anytime soon. 
17 U.S. led airstrikes were carried out on Thursday on IS controlled buildings in the Syrian cities of Raqqa and Kobani. And marking the new year, Syrian President Assad made a rare visit to the front lines of the war in Jobar, east of Damascus. He visited government troops there to encourage them in their fight. Jobar is a former rebel stronghold, and the Syrian government has been trying to oust insurgents from the city in recent months. More than 200,000 people have been injured or killed since the Syrian conflict broke out in March 2011, and nearly half of the nation's population has been displaced. 3.2 million people have fled to the neighboring countries seeking asylum. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Egypt's highest court has accepted an appeal request and ordered a retrial in the case of three jailed Al Jazeera journalists. Peter Gresti, Mohammed Fadel Fami, and Bahir Mohammed. They have been put behind bars for more than a year on charges that they spread false news in support of the Muslim Brotherhood. The three were handed prison sentences of between 7 to 10 years back in June for their alleged crimes. Al Jazeera has called for the prompt release of the journalists, saying they were simply reporting the news. Well, we're now going to try to put smiles on your faces by talking about how this year is the year of the sheep on the zodiac calendar here in Korea. Right. I, I tried to look for some negative aspects of sheep or those born in the year of the zodiac, but uh, that zodiac sign, but there's very little to hmm. find. So sheep, enjoy your day in this year in the spotlight while you can. Our Imuni follows us this report. The sheep at this zoo have gone all out dressed up in cute rainbow-striped clothes. Wearing embroidered hairbands and even pink blush on their cheeks, they're ready to meet the visitors, who came to see them to mark the year of the sheep. They move through the fence at the sound of the bell. Some kids get scared and walk backward out of fear, while others can't take their hands off their plump wool. The sheep feels very soft and nice. I have clothes made of wool, but it feels a lot different touching it with my own hands. The animal is recognized as a source of kindness, humility, and respect for parents, as seen from a young sheep that kneels down for their mother's milk. Sheep are very smart. They can recognize their names and their keeper's voice. I feel proud when they hear me calling them and follow me. It's hoped that the year of the sheep will be calmer than 2014 and bring peaceful and compassionate time, like the spirit the animal symbolizes. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. First morning commute of the year was cold, according to many people in Korea. Some say bitter cold, right? Some would say. For the latest, let's go over to our Kim Bo Gyeong standing by at the Weather Center. Bo Gyeong, what do you have for us? Good evening, guys. Well, make sure to bundle up on your ways home because it is still bitterly cold outside. Now, earlier today, those of you on the West Coast woke up to snowy conditions and flurries are still falling in parts of both Tolado provinces where over 21 centimeters of heavy snowfall has been recorded already. At the moment, it's about minus three degrees here in the capital, but wind chills are pulling down sensory temperatures, making it feel like minus seven. And it looks like this colder than the seasonal average weather will continue through tomorrow afternoon. Other than that, air conditions continue to remain very dry over on the east coastline and Humidity levels are down to 20% in Gangneung of Gangwon-do province, where a dry weather alert is in effect. Plus, strong winds are blowing in those areas, so be careful when starting fires. Well, it looks like on Saturday, morning lows will dip to minus 8, but the cold snap will begin to ease up beginning tomorrow afternoon, and Sunday's daytime high should reach up to 8 degrees. Here are the readings for tomorrow. Seoul reaches to Daegu Gwangju 5, Busan hits 8. On to other regions, Jeju makes it 2, 9, Dokdo hits 6, Mount Kumgang dips to minus 3. Those are the updates I have for you now. Hope you have a lovely Friday evening. We leave you with the international weather.
And that's a wrap. Have a great start to your day or a safe ride or drive home. This has been Daniel Chen. And I'm Nai Hyun Gyeong. Hope everyone will enjoy the first weekend of 2015. We'll be back next week. Bye-bye for now.